Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Cool Thing with PCMag.com. We're talking about the new Apple products from April, April 2021. I'm Sasha Segan. Uh, this is Tom Brandt. And something you've got to know is, OK, so I'm the iOS products guy at PCMag, and Tom is the macOS products guy at PCMag. So that's why we're both on this video. And I just wanted to start by saying, hey, so I've finally got a gadget, which is as powerful or more powerful than one of your PCs. Uh, this new iPad Pro is blowing my mind in terms of the hardware power that is in this thing. Um, I'm just going to- What recap. is that hardware power? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'll recap quickly. Okay, so the, the new iPad Pro uh, comes in two sizes, of course, 11 and 12.9 inches. And uh, the most important thing uh, from my perspective is that it has this Apple M1 chipset in it. And the M1, it's the same chip that's in uh, all, it's in all the latest desktops and laptops, right, Tom? How it's powerful in, so is the M1? It, it's the exact, it's nearly, uh, near as makes no difference, the same chip that uh, was introduced in the MacBook Pro, the 13-inch MacBook Pro and the, and the MacBook Air and the Mac mini desktop last fall. And that essentially with a few cooling and graphics differences is the same thing they put in your super powerful uh, iPad Pro. Yeah, and and so this M1. Now you did a lot of testing of it around the uh, around the uh, MacBook launches. How does it compare to like Intel desktop and laptop chipsets? I feel like we've we've launched ourselves into a realm far beyond what we were previously talking about with uh, some of the earlier A series chips. Yeah. So basically, the difference is that the the difference between an Intel chip and the M1 is that the M1 is much closer to the A series chips in that it has eight cores, not all of which operate at the same time. Um, that means that essentially, if you optimize the software for it, it could run uh, a a CPU intensive task like like editing a hundred megapixel uh, photo much faster than even like you know the latest eleventh generation Core i seven assuming that all the software and stuff it runs uh, in an optimized way. Wow. And okay. So also in these new uh, iPad Pros, we've got a Thunderbolt port, which a friend of mine pointed out on Twitter, the iPad Pro now has more Thunderbolt ports than the entire Microsoft Surface lineup. Why no Thunderbolts on the Surface? <laughs> I know. Okay, Apple's so not responsible for that, though. <laughs> so okay, so it's got it's got a Thunderbolt port. Um, it's got uh, up to two terabytes of internal storage, which is insane. Uh, the big model has a new screen technology. What's interesting is that it's only on the big model, not the small model. Uh, has this new screen technology called Mini LED, which Apple is saying has up to sixteen hundred nits of brightness, which basically I think means you need to wear eclipse glasses. To look well, at this the key thing. thing about the 1600 nits is that's an optimal condition. It's not going to be, not every part of the screen is going to be 1600, but yeah, that's insanely bright. I mean, the MacBook Pro tops out at 500. Yeah, yeah. And and then, of course, it also has integrated 5G with the uh, Qualcomm X55 chipset, um, which is on no Apple laptop, no Surface, right? As far as I know, like, is there, is there anything else PC level that has integrated 5G yet? We do have, uh, there's a there's a Lenovo uh, uh, Yoga 5G laptop. There are a few other business focused laptops from Dell that have 5G. Uh, but my question to about the 5G iPad Pro is, do we actually need the 5G iPad Pro? Well, and that's what comes down to, I did a column yesterday where my biggest question and my biggest complaint about the new iPad Pro is that uh, that the hardware capabilities in here really seem to be outstripping both the software and the networks. Um, for instance, here's another hardware capability. It now supports 6K external displays, okay? 6K external displays, but iPad OS cannot extend your desktop. And that's a perfect example of this is the M1, right? They designed this M1 chip. It's the same in all of the, the, the devices. It, the, the graphics capability support 6K via the uh, USB-C port. But yeah, you're right. You wouldn't use an iPad Pro for that.
Right. So you hook up. Okay. So you have this iPad Pro and you have like a Thunderbolt dock and you're hooking up a 6K external display and a multi terabyte external hard drive and, you know, who knows what else. Um, and then you want to drag a file from one application to another application. And you can't without complicated kludgy workarounds in the iPad Files app. I was like, going to say, feel, I'll give you five minutes, come back and tell me if it's, if it's, if you figured it out. <laughs> exactly. And like what you what you said about the 5G, Apple showed some demos of people doing things like, you know, shooting 8K video on a boat and uploading it with 5G. But I can tell you, cause I'm the 5G guy, they're probably getting like eight megabit, 10 megabit upload speeds on that boat. Like what, what, what the promise of 5G and the reality of 5G in terms of these applications just are not matching up. So we've got a screen, we've got 5G, we've got a new M1, anything else notable about the iPad Pro? Um, yeah, I would say the front facing camera, which is now super, super optimized for our video calling lifestyle. It's got this thing called center stage which is basically works like the Facebook portal where um, it pans and zooms automatically based on your, uh, based on where people are in the frame. So they really want you to use this for zoom. And then once again, just to give you like to continue with the theme. Um, so they have this incredible zoom camp, this incredible camera capability for, for zoom, like super high quality has the center stage thing. I think still in iPad OS, if you take the focus away from zoom to look at a Google doc, zoom pauses. I have not tried it, but, um, but so that so essentially renders that useless. Um, well, it means that you can't, you cannot multitask in any way while you're in a video call, which I guess your boss will be super happy about. <laughs> So, well, not only will the boss be super happy about but that, but that actually is a great segue into our next product, the Mac, which they are saying is an ultimate Zoom machine, uh, but it doesn't have any of those capabilities. Yeah, so the iMac, so you, okay, so it only has a 1080p uh, webcam at the top. Right. With and it doesn't have that, that center stage thing. There's no center stage, but... Um, but see, what you have to understand that, right, that with the iMac, we're coming from, and, and pretty much any, any Windows or Mac desktop or laptop, cameras have been really, really bad. We're coming from, from basically a position of 720p webcams on pretty much everything, including the few all-in-ones that have them. So now they put a 1080p camera, uh, which is essentially full HD resolution into the new iMac, and they went one step further by essentially redoing the image signal processor uh, that's that's in the M1. But none of, no, but yeah, it's not going to follow you around your kitchen. If you set up your iMac in, in your kitchen and you have like a huge family FaceTime with grandma, it's not going to follow you around in that really cool way that the iPad will. But it runs the operating system you want to be running to do that. Yes, there is. And yeah, so so Mac OS uh, Big Sur still does not have touch support. But, you know, if I ever saw a Mac that that, that needed touch support and all that the, the, to combine all that multitasking and, and touch, it's the new iMac because they're sending it's available in all these different colors. Um, they're saying this is the device for working from home and not just working from home, but like doing yoga in the afternoon, having your kids learn. Um, but but yet you you know you you can't touch it uh, as you can the Microsoft Service Studio. Um, so there's a missed opportunity there. Now let's note doing yoga, not Lenovo yoga. <laughs> they should have introduced the iMac yoga. But but okay, and and also the iMac now can run iPad apps, but the iPad cannot run iMac apps, even though they have the same processor. Right, right. And so that's a bit of a one-sided thing, a one-sided focus on the Mac, which, which makes sense for Apple because there's, you know, PC shipments are up 55%. You know, that's what everyone's buying. So they've kind of shifted focus a little bit back to the, uh, to their, to their bread and butter. But I think the capability to run and like, not, not a big uh, iPad app, but say a small, uh, you know, phone style app in the upper right corner of this new 24 inch um, iMac is a great thing. I haven't actually tried that out yet, uh, but I think that that, that could be a, a, a very useful part of it. 
So now they were showing in the presentation that they shrunk down the innards, the logic board and fans of the iMac from, you know, something yay big to about the size of half a Kit Kat bar. What are they filling the rest of this gigantic iMac case with? Balloons? Well, so <laughs> it's the screen, right? The, the, uh, the new iMac is 24 inches, larger than the 20, 21 inch that it replaces. And it weighs about four pounds less, I believe. I think, well, three to four pounds less. We're, going, we're talking about like 13 to nine pounds. So the M1 is a huge part of that, right? Because it doesn't require a ton of cooling. Uh, it's all, it's an integrated system on a chip. Uh, so most of the iMac is now the screen, uh, which is great, but it also goes back to this M1 chip being a one size fits all solution. And that's my main beef with it, which we don't necessarily need to get into now, but, uh, but yeah, I think that they could have done a little bit more with the M1 there. <laughs> you think there should have been an M M1X? Well, yeah. So, so now you have the same chip with, with more or less the same graphics capabilities across all these different products. Um, you know that Apple is working on the next generation, but they're also saying for the iMac specifically that the 27 inch with the Intel core processors is still the iMac for, for creative professionals who need a ton of power. Uh, so we're kind of in a weird, you know, first attempt. Uh, and I would have liked to see maybe they put, uh, you know, a slightly more powerful version of the Apple Silicon for their first attempt in the iMac. Now, I know we were asking this during the launch, uh, during the launch event, but I don't know if you've looked at the spec sheet. Does this have any USB-A ports? Basically, if you buy the base 24 inch, um, uh, iMac with the eight core M1 and the seven core graphics processor, you get a total of two USB-C ports, both of which support Thunderbolt, but that's it. Uh, and then if you upgrade to the higher end one, which I believe is, uh, I forget the, the, the price, then you get those additional two USB ports and you get an additional graphics core. So now, uh, so, so this, is, this is actually a personal question for me um, because my house is made of 2015 MacBook Pros. And I remember six months ago when you reviewed the first M1 laptops, you were like, this is great, but maybe wait a little while. We got some software issues to shake out. Maybe you should wait for the M2. Okay, six months later, should we jump on the M1? Do things look more mature? I think that one of the last holdouts for many Mac users, and I know that probably some of, some of people in your family as well, is the Adobe Creative Suite. Um, that, that it's a huge lift. It's one of the main reasons that, that a lot of people buy uh, Macs because it works very well, the Mac OS version. Um, Photoshop is now M1 native, which I think is a, is a big, reason, a big uh, proponent of that. But um, honestly, for someone who's looking at the MacBook Air, which is the, cheap, the cheapest laptop with the M1, uh, I, I don't really see any good reason to wait for that specific laptop for any, for the next, whatever the next Apple Silicon is. I think that's it. Um, it it's, it's, it's an incredible first effort uh, and, and very different than the iMac, which is kind of like, you know, a, a entry level version. The MacBook Air is almost as powerful, if not as powerful as the MacBook Pro is uh, with, the, with the M1. So I don't really see a reason now, especially that we're six months out from the software to, to not buy it. Okay, so what do you want to hit next? Right. So we did, we, we do, we should briefly mention that, that the iPad and the iMac are the big things uh, that Apple announced yesterday. But what about if you lose uh, one of them, uh, how are you going to find it? Apple now has an answer for that. So am, am I the only person who thinks that the AirTags look like giant coin cell batteries? I mean, they're not the, the most, uh, they're not the most photogenic product that Apple has ever released. Um, but, uh, and, and the funny thing is that, right, that tile is now tile strategy, which w is to basically embed the tile in other things so you don't see it. Um, right. But Apple is, is has this. Well, Apple wants device. you to have that Apple logo on things to make it clear that you're part of the Apple tribe and the Apple group. And it's very, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's almost a social network concept. They want you to show that you're an Apple person. I think so, the air tags. I think the air tags really need to be seen to be believed. We'll have to try those out and, and share our thoughts with you once we try them out. There's privacy implications, things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, the thing that I think everyone's most curious about is this whole sort of surreptitious air tag network thing going on. Where so the air tags, 
the air tags are Bluetooth locators, but also supposedly they will use any other iOS device that they detect in the area to help locate them, which means that if you're wandering around on the street or if your air tag is wandering around on the street and it passes other random people with an iPhone, it might use those phones to help find its location? Is this entirely Yeah, that's, it's using the Find My network. Um, and, and But as someone who probably won't buy uh, an AirTags uh, thing, I don't want, I don't, I mean, I don't necessarily want my iPhone to be helping, to be constantly scanning for that. I feel like there's battery implications. Obviously, Apple would say that there isn't, and they've, they've thought about that, but that's a concern for me. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the that's the biggest question. People also have questions about people about the air tags being used to stalk people or to bug people or we'll we'll have to figure this out by getting the air tags and yeah, we need trying to, we them need out. to test it out. Yeah. <laughs> and then also they they announced a bunch of other little things. There's this Apple Card family thing that just seems to be just seems to be a way to get more people into the Apple ecosystem. Um, and there's a premium podcast subscription, which really just seemed to me to be there, there's a big trend in the world right now and in the tech industry around audio content. Um, Clubhouse, Discord, Twitter's Clubhouse clone. Facebook's Clubhouse clone, everybody else's Clubhouse clone. I saw a joke about Excel having a Clubhouse clone in it. And this seems to be Apple's way of just being in that conversation. Do you, do you, do you agree? Right. Well, you've got to remember too that that, that they introduced this subscriptions, um, Apple podcast subscriptions model at a time when Spotify has kind of taken, like they've kind of come by storm and taken, taken the, uh, the, the podcasts over a bit. Um, which is which is in addition to Clubhouse and all those other things you just mentioned. And, but Apple is the original pod, right? I mean, the iPod is why we have podcasts. So they're, right. I think they're trying to grab a bit of that back. And then for the Apple Card, all I can say is if you want a good, you know, no fee um, rewarding credit card, the Apple Card is not it. Uh, the, the, the Apple Card family idea where you can have, you know, spending controls that exists on many other cards um, you know, get a card with 2% cash back that doesn't require you to use Apple Pay. Uh, and that that's, uh, <laughs> that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> yeah, I still prefer to have my airline card in a vague <clears throat> dream of someday flying on an airplane again. You know, you got to have hope. Um, but okay, so great. That was a lot of Apple product we got yesterday in a tight, beautiful one hour presentation. Please let their presentations all be one hour in the future. It was terrific. Um, we, of course, will be getting in all of these Apple products as soon as we can, testing them as soon as we can, writing about them more on PCMag.com. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. And uh, everyone, uh, please like and subscribe and uh, keep it on PCMag.com for more coverage.